Good morning and welcome to Zen Fits here in Blackstone, Virginia, the center of the world where nothing fits. Oh wait, everything fits. That's a Zen Fit. So let's jump right in here. I'm pumped up and fired up and ready to go. Uh, the top, <coughs> excuse me. Ooh, oh, I just, ha <laughs> ha. Keeping dementia at bay, I just remembered to put on my mic. <laughs> I keep remembering, the older you get, at least with me, the older, the older I get, the more I forget. But because of my practice, I remember quicker. <laughs> anyway, title of this talk is The Horror of Language. The Horror of Language. Yesterday I wrote about, I talked about and wrote about all morning, very few people noticed, uh, about Apocalypse Now and Zen. Apocalypse Now, what's the Zen of Apocalypse Now? Well, if you follow me, you'll, you'll probably get a clue that I'm not talking about Japanese Zen. I'm not talking about a religion, a philosophy, or a cultural tradition, either Japanese Zen, or, or Chinese Zen, or American Zen. No, I'm using Zen creatively. And you really have to listen or listen to my talks or read what I write in order to get what I'm talking about because I don't know. <laughs> but I demonstrate it every day. So in other words, I'm telling you what Zen is. I'm not telling you what awakening is. I'm not telling you what creativity is. I'm demonstrating it. But I'm not demonstrating it because I know I'm just being me. So if you're just you, if you're just being you, totally honest you, you're demonstrating Zen. Zen is just total honesty, total simplicity. You are very, we are all very simple humans, but we make ourselves so complex. We keep adding layers and layers and layers of complexity, like a landfill until we're smothered in information. But if we want to know the truth now, what do we do? We Google it. We think truth is information. This is the horror of language. So <laughs> what made me fire, fired up this morning was that when I, I got to my, I opened my Facebook and uh, I got, the admin had canceled the post, yesterday's posting which was on, and this group was one of these mystical Buddhist groups that I belong to and post my stuff on and get responses from, from people who are interested in this stuff, who are interested in awakening, you know. So they had censored my, my posts because I had posted an offensive picture. And what was the picture? It was the picture of Sheen, the captain, rising out of the water, the abyss, to go and fulfill his mission, which was to kill Colonel Kurtz as a sacrifice and to be born again. The king is dead, long live the king. Sheen killed the king, but he didn't he, but the people, the cult of Kurtz, wanted him to stay and be the leader. But he refused to be the king, and he left and returned to the world. And this is the story of Buddha, for God's sakes. So Buddha, Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, was stirred in the depths of his being by old age sickness and death, he wanted to know what in the, what, what's going on here? Is there no end to this suffering? Is there no cessation of the suffering of old age sickness and death? Which is a metaphor. It's not like old age. I mean, I'm 86 and I'm not looking for a way to live forever because I'm not a Christian. <laughs> but it's not the physical old age sickness and death you see. So I'm 86 and I've got uh, uh, 
dormant uh, prostate cancer, I guess. And I'm happy as hell. <laughs> but that's beside the point. <laughs> but the point, the point is, the Buddha wanted to find out what the the cessation of this suffering of consciousness, this suffering, this nagging, nagging feeling that something is not complete, that I'm missing something, that there's more to life than I'm living. Something is missing. Something is missing. Uh, like we want to be Texans and say, oh, there's more. It's bigger. It's, the answer is to get bigger, 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 more, more, more. Supersize everything. Supersize it. Supersize it. You know, that's our answer. Get more. But the more we get, the more we suffer. So that's not the answer, you know. So anyway, Buddha goes and he tries all, he goes to all these different teachers or Colonel Kurtz who are living in the forest and have found the answer and they have developed a following. And he stays with each one and he masters their teaching. And each teacher says, oh, oh, Shakyamuni, stay with me and inherit my students and stay with me and become a cult leader. Stay with me and become a guru. Stay with me and become a guru like me and take over my, I get it all here, all my followers and teaching and everything and you'll be, you'll be a famous guru. And Sakyamuni went on. This is not it. So he left all the teachings. While he was invited because he had he had mastered the teachings of each of these teachers. He had mastered their samadhi. He had, he had mastered their enlightenment and found it to be lacking. So he moved on. And finally, having exhausted all of the strategies, the asceticism, starving yourself, self-denial, no booze, no meat, no sex, no food, no desires, he eliminated it all and he was close to death and he realized this was not it either. And a little cowgirl came along with a bowl that she'd been saving and she gave him some milk and it revived him. And he put the bowl in the, in the water and he said to her, if this bowl flows upstream, the Buddha will be awakened and he sat under the Bodhi tree and he vowed not to leave until he realized the cessation of suffering. And he sat. And it was that kind of a vow that we need to make. I want to know why I suffer. God damn it, I want to know. Why do I feel alienated from my own experience? Why do I feel separated? No matter, no matter how excited and how wonderful everything is, there's still this feeling of being separate, being exiled, outside looking in. You know, like the little image of the Christmas and everybody is inside opening presents in a big happy commercial of joy and the little boy is standing outside the cold window looking in on these happy people in the commercial enjoying air, uh, uh, air, uh, air freshener and they're enjoying uh, uh, Irish Spring soap <laughs> and, and they're enjoying a Big Mac and uh, all these happy things in the commercial but we're outside looking in we just can't quite get in there we just can't be happy like them we can't be happy like the people in the commercial, which is our secular promised land. Oh, if you just buy this product, you'll be permanently happy and free from old age and sickness and death. Whew. Okay. <laughs> you get the idea? Okay, I forgot the idea, but let me get back to the, to the horror of language. So this Buddha group that I respected, they publish my stuff. I don't know what it's uh, kind of like one of these awakening groups that combination combination of Lao Tse and Eckhart Tolle and, and whatnot, and they combine a little different teachings and they put a group up and the people come and they all um, 
sit around the campfire and talk about the promised land by by quoting quotes and saying amen and all that. Well, I post myself on these groups. I, I post my writings on them because they're my discoveries. What I discover are on the path daily that these groups are interested in. So I posted the one on, on the Apocalypse Now and the admin... Um, after it was on <laughs> for a day, came along and object, rejected it because I posted the picture of, of uh, Sheen, the hero, rising out of the water as a primitive in the face, you know. And that's the key to the whole movie. But it was offensive. So this picture, can you post more pleasant pictures? This was, this was offensive to our readers. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> So what is the ter what is the horror of language? Well, what what the horror of language is that we as a culture, the American culture, the American mind, which is us, have lost. Well, it's not we have lost it. We haven't lost it, but there is a uh, inertia. There is a uh, stream, a mainstream of perception that is fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is literalness, is the, is the belief that words are real, is the belief that words are real, and that's where the curiosity stops. So the literal mind, the fundamental mind, says this is this, and it can't have it be anything else. So take this, for instance. This literally is a martini glass, and it's got monkeys on it. And you say, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting glass. Uh, where did you get that? Who made it? Uh, do, do they have any more? Could I buy one? Uh, so we focus on the glass. But I see this as a metaphor. This points, the two monkeys, is a metaphor. Now the metaphor has two faces. Metaphorical thinking liberates you from language from the word believed in. The word believed in is that this is a glass, see, G-L-A-S-S. -S. Or you could say, well, what kind of glass? Well, it's a martini glass. Oh, okay, it's a martini glass. So that makes it different from just a plain old glass with water in it. This is a martini glass because it's got the shape of a triangle, you see, a little chalice. And then it's crafted, so it's different from other glasses. So, oh, this is a unique martini glass, right? But I'm still thinking it's a glass. So no matter what I, what I say about it, it's still a glass. But for me, it's a metaphor. I mean, it's a glass, but it also points to the monkey mind, my mind. It points to my mind. With, with a monkey of thinking jumping from one word to another and hanging on to the word. It has, the monkey mind has no vision. The monkey mind cannot see beyond the banana. The monkey mind can't see beyond the word. Everything is what it is, what it's named, you see. So we're, we're trapped in the prison of our language, which names everything, puts it in the dictionary, and slams it shut or in Google now. So if you want to know what this is, you would go to Google and it would give you the information about the glass, you see. But it wouldn't give you a vision. It wouldn't give you understanding. It wouldn't give, it wouldn't get you out of the prison of our language. It wouldn't give you the feeling of being free, of being creative. It wouldn't give you liberation from the feeling that something is missing. It wouldn't give you the cessation of suffering. It wouldn't give you the cessation of the monkey mind. The monkey mind, which is two, 
It's yes, this is the banana. No, that's not the banana. Yes, no. No, yes. Wow, 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 wow. Hush, what should I do? Do this? Do what? What kind of a glass is this? Oh, it's a martini glass. Well, it, well, no, anyway. Do you get the idea? Vision is metaphorical thinking. Where you look at the thing that everyone, oh, this is a glass. So, so I give these to people and I say, you know, uh, did you watch uh, uh, Indiana Jones and the, and the Last Crusade? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I, and I show them my martini glasses. My uncle gave me 500. I've been giving them away. And I say, uh, choose one. But one of these is the Holy Grail, so choose wisely. Oh, and they laugh. They think that's so funny. <laughs> but it's the truth. <laughs> if you could see this glass metaphorically, it would be your Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is what Buddha was looking for. The Philosopher's Stone. He was looking for a way out of the prison of form. The, and form is a prison because we name everything. And we believe the names are real. We can't see beyond the name. And the name is just what my monkey mind is holding. The two monkeys of the mind. It's this. No, it's that. No, it's that. No, it's this. Yes, no, no, it's this. Wow, 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 wow. Fighting over a monkey, a, a banana. Or swinging from word to word. See, so go to Google. The monkey mind doesn't have any vision. All it does is swing from word to word. And argues, oh, this is the word? No, and, and another monkey swings to another word and says, no, this is the word. Now we've got a war of words. There's no vision. There's no whole. There's no, there's no cessation of the prison of being trapped in our language. And we can't get out because we can't see beyond the name. This is the whole teaching of yoga and the Eastern traditions and Buddha is the prison of the name and form, Nama Rupa. We have named the world like Adam and Eve, Eve and now we're present, imprisoned in it. And we wander the face of the earth looking for a way out of our names, of our, of our language, of our belief in words. So it's so you, but we have to use words. It's not, oh, you can't think, you can't use words. No, you use words, metaf you use the words to get out. One of my favorite gyms was there's a, an explorer who's trapped in the ice and he hasn't got any tools and all he's got is a frozen turd. So he uses the turd to chip his way out of the ice. And when he gets out of the ice, he throws away the turd. He doesn't carry it with him. <laughs> So we use words to chip out of the prison of words, but we have to use them metaphorically. So these poor people in this Buddha group, you see, thought, oh, this is an offensive picture because it I don't know what it looks like. This man's coming out of the water and his face is painted. He looks bad. Not seeing the metaphorical meaning of it, the vision of it. They didn't see the context. All we see is the word. We always see is the glass. We don't see the context. So to finish, my uncle spent his the last years of his life in Tampa, a photographer collecting martini glasses. Now, literally, he was just an old man collecting martini glasses. But in my mind, my uncle was Sir Percival, the Grail Knight, looking for the Holy Grail looking for the Holy Grail in the last years of his life. Maybe this is it. Oh no, there's another one. No, that's it. And the art galleries, Tommy, we got another martini glass. You go down, maybe spend $50 for the damn thing. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the Holy Grail. No, that isn't it. Give me another one. Thanks for dropping in. Find the Holy Grail. Find the Holy Grail. And, uh, Break out of the prison of language, the horror, the horror. <laughs>